And I'm going to speak about why allocators actually give money to investment managers. What is the job to be done? So I'm going to present to you some research that I did. Uh, my co-authors were Brent Beardsley, formerly partner at BCG, now senior executive at Vanguard, and Katina Stefanova, formerly management committee at Bridgewater. And we were studying the question of why do allocators give money to whom they choose? So a little bit about my background, if this works. OK. Uh, so one page on me. I'm with Cool Water Capital. Cool Water is an accelerator for emerging VC funds. We invest in the general partnership as a limited partner, and it's the management company. We have backed 204 VC funds in all areas of innovation. FinTech, InsureTech, FemTech, you name it. Uh, we are indirectly legally the largest tech accelerator in the world because our funds have invested in over 5,000 companies. As a benchmark, our combinator has invested in about 4,500. So we are, by the nature of our business, we are all over the innovation space because our funds are in every possible area of innovation. But we have a particular interest in FinTech. My background is as a serial FinTech entrepreneur with two exits, previously a partner at two New York VC funds, F of Venture Capital and Hoff Capital, with particular focus on FinTech. So the framework that my co and I chose was first, what are some examples of the innovative, disruptive innovation? And I listed some here. By the way, you can get this whole deck on my website. I'll share the link. Uh, but I'll use one of the most famous examples, which is Vanguard. When Vanguard launched, people mocked it. They said, you're selling mediocrity, right? Definitional mediocrity at a low price. I'll, I'll grant you that. And you think that people are going to give money to this wacky idea of an index fund. And it took a few years for anyone to pay any attention at all to Vanguard and its ilk. Then, of course, index funds took off over time. And that became a huge part of the investment management industry. And is, of course, quite disruptive to many, many active managers. So Clay Christensen, uh, formerly the late Clay Christensen of Harvard Business School, he popularized the idea of disruptive innovation theory. And to oversimplify his research, he said the pattern of disruptive companies is they do one job very well, in the case of Vanguard, low prices, and they ignore all the other jobs. If you think about Vanguard versus Fidelity, right? Fidelity offers lots of things, right? They offer conferences. If you're a high-end client, they offer many, many different types of funds, right? You can adjust it for every type, every geography and style you want, whatever, right? And Vanguard offered this very simple product, and the Fidelities of that era in the 70s laughed at it, but they rose up, right? Because they were doing one job well, and that allowed them to disrupt the market. And this pattern repeats in many, many other sectors of technology. So. Christensen said, to analyze what companies have the chance to be disruptive and who is at risk, you should look at the jobs to be done. What are you actually hiring an investment manager to do? So if you had asked me as a novice VC a decade ago, I would have said, well, alpha, right? That's my job as an investment manager. But that is the wrong answer. There are over two dozen different reasons why we solved it. Um, there are over two dozen different reasons why allocators give money to investment manager, and Alpha is just one of them. So I'm going to go through what our research found. We interviewed sovereigns, family offices, other large allocators, and we tried to find the patterns in their answers. And I will submit to you, and I will give you examples, that the companies that today are addressing some of these jobs to be done, those are the vanguards of tomorrow, right? Those are the disruptive companies the, the established investment management industry should worry about. So, we break it down to three areas. The technical job, right? What are you actually, uh, uh, what's the offer? The functional, what's the user experience? And the emotional, how people feel about it. So first is the investment strategy, right? So I went, I said earlier, your job is alpha. So who's really, really good at alpha and terrible at everything else? Historically, it's people in the emerging asset classes, internet domain names, Bitcoin a decade ago, right? Terrible on many levels, right? You want regulatory compliance, you want uh, clarity of ownership, terrible. But if you invest in things like this early, you make a lot of money, right? Because you're prioritizing one job. Another is not to lose money, to protect your downside. And so the structured notes industry, right, is premised on that. An example of that is Axio, which is a structured notes platform acquired a little while ago by iCapital Network, focusing on protect my downside. Another is match your liability. The universal liability is inflation. Who's good at that? Well, 
BlackRock has made a great business in selling something that matches your liabilities and inflation. Treasury Direct back up, which I encourage you all to sign up for, right? What gives you at a very low cost a guaranteed inflation match for you personally. Uh, you can invest up to 10K personally and through an LLC you own and per child, right? By the way, that's the hack around the 10K per person limit. Another is to minimize expenses. Vanguard, of course, does this very well, right? They can't guarantee you the upside, but you know you are not going to lose a lot of money in fees if you give money to Vanguard. A friend of mine says he loves private bankers. They'll manage your money until there's nothing left, right? So <laughs> Vanguard, <laughs> Vanguard, with due respect to the private bankers in the room, Vanguard helps to address that issue. So another is tax minimization. One of the reasons I really like my space, a really stage VC, is the regulatory system makes us a very, very tax-favored investment for reasons too technical to go into here. But there's a lot of complexity around tracking this, your QSBS status and so on. And so there's a company, Cap Gains, that does that in an automated fashion to make sure that you are minimizing your taxes both at point of entry and thereafter, depending on the wrinkles of your particular investment. So now there is exposure to targeted sectors. Many, many times an allocator will say, I really want exposure to this geo, this strategy, whatever. How do I do that? And so I'm an investor in Republic. We're going to be hearing more from them later. And that's part of their secret sauce, is you can go on and you can identify in the world of alts for a retail investor a investment that will hit your particular hot button, right? Some geography, some uh, uh, affiliation you have, and give you a product that hits that. Because they have enough scale, they, they can give you exposure to whatever sector excites you. Another is legacy impact. So an example of that would be ASAC, which I'm investor in. ASAC uh, came out of Uganda originally, and they're offering microfinancing originally for uh, drivers, people who are couriers, moving things around. Right? These are folks with no credit history. Uh, they don't have any assets other than their motorcycle. And they're so low asset that they literally don't have enough cash to fill up their motorbike with gas. So they drive for a couple miles, they earn some money, then they go to the gas station, get some more cash, then they get rides more miles and make some more cash. Right? Like, these are folks who are really living at the edge of financial uh, sustainability. So if you can give them access to a little bit of credit, you allow them to do things like fill up the gas tank. Right? To most of us in this room, that's sort of a trivial life optimization. Obviously, you fill up the tank. But for some folks in the world, they need financial help just to be able to do that. So SOC is offering sustainable returns, but there are definitely people giving them capital in part to help achieve the social impact goal of helping the lives of people who are very financially deprived. Another is protection from tail risks. I think this is much more top of mind for many of us after the past few years of COVID and one war and another war, right? Tail risks really do matter. And so Predata is a firm that monitors non-traditional information sources, the dark web, et cetera, looking for new risks. One of their case studies, they claim that if you've been a paying client, everyone says this, if you were a paying client, you would have gotten early notice about COVID, right? You've stocked up in your PE, right? But it's a, certainly a valid argument that this can help you get early insight into the next big tail risk, which we all know will come, right? There is not a gray, not a black swan, but a gray rhino, to quote a woman, <coughs> right? There are uh, well-known risks thundering on the horizon, which we all need to manage against. So the next set of jobs is the execution. How do you actually deploy the capital? So I'm going to walk through some of the processes of executing investment in companies that are helping make that more efficient. So on Origination, uh, I'm working with a company called Auto out of Boston, which uses generative AI to source deals for private equity funds. This has become a common, uh, a lot of folks are experimenting with this. The way it works is you say to them, I'm looking to invest in companies in the Midwest, EBITDA, 10 million plus, make a target list, and then send them an email saying, hi, I'm a private equity fund. I'm interested in talking about investment. But they don't feel canned because they're looking through the target's profile and the sender's profile, and they'll say, oh, you went to the same college as me. Oh, congratulations on your recent yachting award. Right? The same sort of work that a junior uh, business development representative would do. So there's a lot of sophistication to it, because you have to not say congratulations on your recent such and such when it's a new story about them getting arrested, right? <laughs> which happens. Uh, and so they have to carve out all of the factors that you don't want to put in your canned email in order to do this at scale. 
And what they're finding is it dramatically lowers origination cost for the banks, the deed funds that they're working with. The virtuous circle here, which I'm looking for as a VC, is they have a data set of what sales pitches work, what gets the target to respond, and what actually results in a consummated deal. So ChatGPT will generate canned emails for you, no problem, right? But they don't have this, the circle of generating data of which emails are more likely to get a response. So another is Drop, another company I'm investor in. So Drop is out of Canada, and they started with a multi-brand loyalty platform, like frequent flyer points, except across many different vendors, right? Your Tim Hortons, right? Your other uh, chains, which you frequent, which if you're Canadian, you probably frequent. And they took that model and they brought it to America. And then they realized they were sitting on opt-in data for millions of users' credit and debit card transactions. So they started selling that data to hedge funds, P funds, and so on, who are using it to, uh, to do due diligence or to look for fast-growing vendors. Years ago, I was an investor in a meal kit company. We use this to understand churn, which is a big issue in the meal kit industry, and also where people are taking dollars from. You can only eat so much food, right? So if you're spending a lot of money on Plated, which is my old company uh, where, I, where I was an investor, are you spending less money on your Whole Foods or on your Costco, right? Where else is, are your calories coming from? And we could get the data in real time by using the data from Drop. So if you think about the actual decision-making process, when I was an investment banker at Bear Stearns, a blessed memory, so the process was, right, you build a complex financial model, you do a couple of sensitivity analysis, you put it into a memo, and then there's a, a wise person's committee meeting where they say, okay, let's do this deal. And there are a couple problems with that model. One is that it's extremely hard to recycle and analyze your assumptions because inevitably there's turnover in the staff, and so the spreadsheets are very, very poorly documented. They're also full of bugs. Uh, and it's very hard to do a lot of sensitivity analyses, right? In the real world, there are many different variables that fluctuate that can impact your investment. It's not just one or two variables of how high is inflation, right? So Bullet Point Network is a company founded by Mike Ryan, formerly a partner of Goldman Sachs here in New York. And what they do is effectively easy Monte Carlo analysis at scale with documentation of your assumptions. So you put in all of the assumptions that drive a deal, right? Inflation and sales growth and chance of war and whatever else in your particular situation. Document where they get them from. Figure out what is a reasonable range of assumptions for each of those variables. And then do we write a check, right? Because this makes sense. And because you have a proper record of it, you can more readily judge, are we doing our job well? Is the person who led this deal doing his or her job? And act accordingly. Uh, one of my heuristics, by the way, for investing is anything that is being done by Excel, if I can figure out a way to put it in something more modern, you can make money. <laughs> as much as I love Excel. Um, so another job to be done is to manage the portfolio. I'm an investor in Stratify, which brings institutional caliber risk management to retail. If you think about the user experience of a typical uh, you know, million dollar AUM person on Fidelity, right, there's a simple tick box, high risk, medium risk, low risk. Right? It's incredibly crude. If you're a real institution, then obviously you have much more sophisticated ways of thinking about your risk. So they're bringing some of that sophistication to retail so that they can more appropriately manage their risks. And they're doing that via channel of RIAs uh, in order to, to reach out to all those retail because it's hard to reach them directly. So what I like about this is being married to a risk manager, I, I have some sensitivity to this. Uh, I think risk is an underappreciated job. My wife hopefully would not say she's underappreciated. Uh, and if you can enable more people to have to get that job done, you will enhance their returns. Another is exit, right? So Axial is a company here in New York, which is a marketplace for mid-market private companies. It's a little bit like what you heard earlier about Mercer, except a different niche. And part of the sales process here, the use per case, is if you think about the world of mid-market private companies and how they're bought and sold, it's a bunch of PDFs and data rooms, right? The data is completely non-standardized. So they are bringing standardization to that process and allowing you as the buy side to more efficiently zoom into the companies that make more sense. By the way, they originally tried to get rid of the bankers, right? Just wipe them out as a use case and replace them, but they found that they were too embedded, you needed them, and so the business models evolved to include the bankers. So it's more of a tool for the bankers and the buy side and the sell side to all do their job more efficiently. So 
Blank's technical job is to administer the investments. I'm an investor in Adapar, which uh, started off with uh, Joe Lonsdale and some colleagues, made a lot of money in his late 20s, and realized a typical family office runs an Excel and PDF. Adapar provides work, which provides uh, alternative data in many different data sets for corporates, for hedge funds, and so on. And part of the, the secret sauce there is having fresh data. And you have this interesting problem, right? You have fresh credit card data, right? What did people spend in the last 24 hours on all their credit cards across millions of Americans? And how do you, as the, the proprietor of that data, fully exploit it? Well, part of the way you do that is you tell clients, we will give our top four highest paying clients access to this data four hours before everyone else, right? So there's a lot of experimentation going on in the alt data industry around giving the highest paying clients uh, data as little as an hour before everyone else, that can make a big difference to the cer certain sophisticated clients. Another is control. Republic, which I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the reasons why people are putting money onto Republic and like platforms, even though they could put money into any of the many, many mutual funds, hedge funds, VC funds, who will gladly intermediate for them, is they want control, right? Everyone thinks they're a better investor than the professionals. There are endless academics who will say, if you are a retail person and you are not a professional stock picker, you should not put money into retail. The chart that we saw earlier showed that the percentage of retail in this public markets has gone down over time, but it's still huge, 30%, I think, right? So why are all those people who don't actually know anything about stocks, right? They're retired dentists or whatever. Why are they doing that? Because they want control and they think they're a better stock picker than the professionals at Fidelity. I disagree. I think they should give money to a professional, but you know they don't listen to me. So there is this is a fundamental human need, and a lot of money is made by serving retail. My hedge fund friends would say they make money because they trade against the dumb retail. Uh, lastly, I'll highlight excitement. Um, people invest because they they want that thrill. They want to talk about something cool at a, at a cocktail party. I'm investing in Indiegogo which is a platform for crowdfunding new products, films, movies, books. And one of the fascinating things about it is you're not actually getting a financial return in most cases. But they still have millions of dollars that are being deployed across the platform. For example, I, years ago I was looking at a company called Interaxon out of Canada, which makes a brain-sensing headset to help you meditate better, help you improve your sleep. And we said to them, the super early stage, go into Indiegogo, and launch a crowdfunding campaign to see if people will pay money. So they launched a video saying, we have this idea for a brain sensing headset, no like funny gunk or shaving of the head required, and we think we can build it. Here's a demo video of this thing that doesn't exist. And 300K of money came to them from people on the internet who said, this is really cool. When you, if you actually produce this thing, mail it to me, and here's an advance payment. We as VCs said, Okay, that's validation of people buy this thing where they literally said, we haven't manufactured it yet, we don't know if we can manufacture it. You've just de-risked it, thank you very much. We gave them some money as an equity check, and so they got non-dilutive financing, plus they got dilutive equity financing from my prior firm. So uh, I will be around all day, happy to talk about this further. Uh, if you think I've missed any jobs to be done, please tell me. <laughs> or if you think there are vendors that we should be thinking about that are the next generation of disruptive companies that are going to rise up and are going to eat the market share of the established investment management industry, please tell me. I'm always looking to learn. Thank you.